hieratic part shouldn't be too stressful because we're just going to be looking at it. Uh, the, really the way you, you always start learning hieratic is by um, putting a manuscript and a transcription side by side and kind of reading them side by side to get a sense of what all the hieratic signs look like. And you're, you're kind of just, it's, it's like training a neural network, right? And quite literally. So you're just going through and kind of mapping the shapes of the hieratic signs onto the hieroglyphic signs. And you're doing that, you're, you're throwing a lot of data at it, right? Like we're gonna go through this whole text and compare the hieratic to the hieroglyphic. And after reading an entire text in hieratic in that way, you will know all the hieratic signs. You don't actually have to sit down and purposely memorize them. That said, it is very valuable to practice writing, which is also something that we're gonna do in this class. I know Aurelio already has his neat setup uh, with his camera and everything. Aurelio, can you show that to us? Do you know, is that possible to show us the, the camera view on Zoom? Okay. So, hey guys, I don't know if, can you hear me? Oh, now? he's here. Okay. Yay, finally. Sorry about that. I should have practiced this. <laughs> okay, cool. So, yeah, um, maybe I just share my screen. I, I thought I'd try something. Can you guys see this? Yep. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Yep. All right. So, what that is, is just a little camera that actually allows me to, to record handwriting as I'm wow. doing it. So I had been thinking about making some, some hieratic calligraphy videos for a while because there really isn't too much out there, um, unlike for Chinese or Japanese. So yeah, and I thought, well, if we want to use that at some point in time in, in class, I love handwriting. So uh, I have a little tool here handy. It's awesome. Yeah, we will definitely use this. Um, like the, oops. <laughs> what sort of pen are you using? Oh, it's a paintbrush. Uh, no, it's a uh, good point. I've tried different things. And uh, for example, Dante knows about that whole saga because we've, uh, we've looked at that together on the, on the chat and uh, Christian, of course, and the other Christian. So um, this here is the so-called witch pen. Um, so I've tried different things. I've tried a Chinese painting brush. It's really not the right thing. That's not what they used. Um, and you can use a fountain pen with a broad, broad edge like this. Um, but really a dip pen like this gives you the best results, especially once you start writing on papyrus. Um, what these do is, I'm not sure you guys can see that, but essentially the metal part in front is sort of folded over. So it has a round edge this way. Um, the advantage is papyrus is very fibery. Writing on paper, it doesn't really make a difference, but once you get to papyrus, if you have any sharp edges or something, they get stuck in the fibers and then, um, it just basically you have ink splattering all over the place. Mm. And of course it looks horrible. And then somewhere online, I saw that somebody said you should use a witch pen for, uh, for papyrus and it worked like, works like a charm. They come in different sizes. This is a smaller one. This is a bigger one. And all you do is basically, after you get them, you wash them to get the protective coating off. That's a one-time thing. And you just dip them in ink and then you can start writing. And then what yeah, kind of you ink do you use? Ah, another good question. So for ink right now, this is Arabic calligraphy ink, um, but you could just use normal India ink. If I want more flowiness, these are very watery. If you want more flowiness, you can use uh, acrylic ink. I bought a few different ones and played with it. Depends on the paper you're using. Uh, for example, for papyrus, I use the, the, um, the acrylic. For paper, it's, that becomes too soggy. So I use the Arabic calligraphy ink, which I got online. Looks like this. The acrylic becomes too soggy on paper? Um, depends on the paper. Um, there is like some kind of watercolor paper, which is pretty much cool with everything. But if you use like normal copy paper, it goes all over the place. So it depends a bit. You have to experiment a bit. Try in an inconspicuous area until you find something you like. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, great. Because what, Peter knows about yeah, the whole what, saga because he's also practicing. What, uh, what kind of camera are you using too? That's really cool. It, looks almost uh, like an iPhone or something. Hang on, I can show you that. Um, if I can turn this one on, let me see. Can you guys see this? Uh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. So it's like on a little arm. Uh -huh. um, wow, that's awesome. It also comes with a mic, which obviously I don't have on right now. 
but yeah, it's it's pretty cool. You can adjust it whichever way you want to, and uh, it plugs right in. Sort of like That's a camera awesome. on like a like a uh, bedside lamp stand, so you can like, move it around. That's yeah, what that's it is. Really cool. Yeah, that, that's, that's super neat. Um, so yeah, once we get to the point of writing, uh, so everyone will be asked to practice some writing. I'll do it myself. Um, I'm I'm not as good at it as Aurelio is, so you know, um, I would guess that most of you will probably be better at it than me right out of the gate. So. You know, don't be concerned with like your artistic abilities or whatever. Uh, we're just going to practice writing the signs because one of the big things that you get from trying to write them are things like stroke order. Like if you if you draw the strokes in a different order, you get a subtly different result, and you can actually tell just by practicing how the original signs probably would have been written, and they were often written in different ways too. And so you can look at two different variations of a sign and see how the uh, change in stroke order affected the shape of the sign over time and things like that. Uh, you really can't get that any other way. You have to just go through it yourself, kind of do your own experimental archaeology project and um, like derive the principles from, like just infer them uh, from, from what you find when you practice it. So we'll definitely do some of that uh, for today. Well, a couple of things. So First thing I wanted to do was just go over some of the resources. So uh, there's a few things in here, Not too high up. Um, the folder has all the PDFs in it. Uh, there's also this book. Aurelio, can you pronounce his name for me? Can you give me this name? Sure, um, Muller. 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 Mm -hmm. I've, I was never sure of the exact pronunciation of that. It's just a little, when you have the, all the, the liquids and the umlauts together, it gets confusing for me. <laughs> anyway, uh, so Müller, uh, this is the, the classic work of hieratic paleography. There are actually uh, three volumes uh, that differ by year. So the one I'm looking at right now is um, from the time of Tutmosis III until the 21st dynasty. Gosh, the German numbers, oh my gosh. Um, so this is the one that most closely corresponds to the text that we're going to be reading. So the, the signs will be uh, most similar. And he, he gives uh, different versions from, from different texts. So you can kind of see how they vary uh, within one time period because hieratic wasn't uh, totally fixed either across time, so it, it changed over time and it, it evolved into, you know, into demotic even or abnormal hieratic. So it, it changed a lot over time. And it also varied within a single time period. So from one text to the to another, uh, different scribal hands vary. So having this sort of table gives you a sense of like the, the range of variation that you could expect to see with a given sign. The only bad thing about this, well, really there are two bad things. Uh, about this particular book. Uh, one is that there's no way to go from hieratic sign to entry. So if you, if you encounter a new hieratic sign that you can't identify, you pretty much have to search through the book. Um, one second. Apparently OU Texas game is happening right now. I'm getting live updates. I just silences. Okay, uh, so you can't look things up by sign. Uh, that's actually a project that I'm working on. We're working on building uh, like a simple web app that lets you draw a hieratic sign and get the closest matches. Uh, similar to the things that you see with like uh, with Chinese signs, you can you have various apps where you can draw it and, and find out what sign it is. I'm trying to make that for hieratic, it's still a work in progress. Uh, the other downside is that it doesn't actually use the Gardner sign code numbers. It uses a similar but different system. Um, every sign is just given a unique number. There are sections like A is men, uh, B is women, uh, just like in, in Gardner sign codes. Yeah, there we go. But the, the things don't exactly match. The easiest way that I know to deal with that is to use this thing, mm -hmm. index Muller, 
Um, I'm just going to pronounce it molar from now on because that's the way Americans pronounce it. And, you know, I sound like a try hard if I try to do the proper pronunciation of time. So uh, this is also in the in the folder on the Google Drive. And this way you can look things up by their Gardner sign code, and then it gives you the corresponding molar number that you can just use to find it in here. Pretty easy. So I just randomly chose this one, the, the where sign, the, the man with the stick. And here it is. We're going to see it in the text we're looking at today, actually. So there you go. It's kind of an easy one. Quick, quick, quick question. Sure. So on, on the index, um, the second column is Gardner, the third color is, column is Muller. Um, and I'm assuming like for the, uh, here's an example on page four, uh, where he's got a V2, P12, N1. I'm assuming that's volume two, plate one, oh no, page 12, number one, maybe? Yeah. Um, that's an example right there, or the one. Oh, there's one here. Yeah. Course. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm assuming that's what that is. Page 12, note one, I would guess. Uh, so okay. we're in volume two, I believe. Um, page 12 should be note one. Yeah. Okay. So this is, yeah. this is the thing that is pointing to. Let me just go back and double check. Yeah. So this is yep. the, um, the running horse. Oh, okay. Christian, cool. Christian, you forgot a little third downside, though. What's that? I mean, the two you mentioned are very valid. Well, the other one is it's handwritten German, right? <laughs> the third <laughs> is as determinator or determinative nur drei s eins wie bitte? Nur drei s eins belegbar. So yeah, that's the other challenge that sometimes relevant information is unfortunately hidden in 19th century German handwriting. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're working on about, that's the other thing I noticed about Faulkner too is like all of it was handwritten and so I love that that version of the dictionary that's on the archive that the wonderful person typed it all out. Yegodovich. <laughs> Yegodovich, yeah. He's great. Yegodovich is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, so publishing um, hieratic texts used to be very, I'm, no, I'm sorry, uh, hieroglyphic texts used to be very, very difficult. Uh, Gardner actually had a set of um, lead type, uh, you know, cut and stamped in order to publish his book. Uh, but obviously not everyone can afford to do that. That's extraordinarily costly. Uh, today with, with Unicode is pretty easy. The only downside of Unicode is that you can't format things on top of one another quite yet. Uh, that's, I think that's coming in a new update. It's not supported on OS 10 yet, which is why the keyboard doesn't yet support it. Uh, but that's a pretty minor downside when it comes to being able to just like print things with hieroglyphs or just like make a Google doc that has hieroglyphs in it. Uh, can't quite format them, but you know, yeah, pretty minor. Um, okay, so a few downsides, but something that addresses them is this website, which is also listed here. Um, it's, the, the, the page is a little busy, but if you tinker around with it, you'll figure it out pretty quickly. Uh, at the top, search for something, find the thing in here. Uh, I just chose the, the G1 hieroglyph. Uh, that's what I searched for. And then you can, you can actually facet. When you find the right thing, you facet by that thing. And then you get all the examples of it. So that's, that's quite convenient. Again, you're only going from hieroglyphic to hieratic. So you can't really use it to identify an unknown sign. Uh, but it's it's much faster for looking things up than uh, using the index and then going through things. Although, to be honest, I normally still do things this way. I don't know why. I mean, this is objectively better, but I don't know. I feel like I'm, I'm so fast with using the index um, that that's normally the way I go about it. Okay, so those are a few resources. And then those are, those are general hieratic resources. And then the text itself. So after much discussion, we chose the contendings of Horace and Set, which is a really nice um, sort of semi-mythological folktale. I think it's a, I think it's an excellent example of ancient storytelling. Uh, There's something in Discord earlier about like it, it lacks suspense and it, you know, there, there's some comment about how it's like not really 
a great story by modern standards. But that's, I don't know. These, I feel like that's, that's unfair. Like it also doesn't have a three act structure, right? They're not, they're not building on the tradition of like narrative writing that we are. So um, the complaint was that it lacks suspense, which is also the complaint that I hear like from beta readers about my writing fairly often is that like, there's not enough tension. You have to put in more tension. But honestly, I don't, this is kind of a rant, but like most stories that I encounter lately, like most things written in the last 10 years have way too much shoehorned in tension. Like the person has to try to do the thing and then fail at it. And then they like go to rock bottom and they have to crawl their way back up. And it's like, I don't know, maybe it's just a matter of taste, but like, can't we just see people doing cool stuff? Do we really need, does it really need to be some crisis at all points for it to be good fiction writing? I don't think so. I disagree with that claim. And I think it's, it's born out of a particular um, contemporary perspective on how stories should be. And uh, I think, I think it's highly subjective. Uh, I personally don't agree with it, but that's the story. Uh, so the, the general outline of the story is that um, Osiris, uh, Set kills Osiris or Osiris has died in some way. We don't really know how in this story. And then it's a question of who will succeed, succeed Osiris as king. Mm. And the candidates are Osiris's son, Horus, or his brother, Set, uh, who murdered him, according to most versions of the story. And we don't know the exact origins of this story, but just, just like we have uh, the contendings of Horus and Set, and we have um, allusions to this, the um, Osiris stories, and then we have uh, Plutarch's version in Greek. Um, De Isidae and Osiridae, I think, something like that. Uh, it has a Latin title. Uh, that's the only version we actually have of the set murdering Osiris myth. But then we have things like this that clearly build on it. So Osiris has already been murdered. Now it's a question of who's going to succeed him to the throne. And uh, the debate is whether it should be his brother or his son. And it's, it's quite likely that this story had a role in, in the political climate where it originated. Um, it probably had a political role. So we see things uh, in the pre-dynastic period, like, uh, let's just look up Haas Hemwi. Oops. So there was a king called uh, Haas Hemwi and his original, oh, it doesn't show any of his cartouches. It's the most interesting part. Um, so most, most Serac names before this had just the Horus on them. And then his, or I think Peribsen had the set animal and then his has the, the horse. He started off as Hasehem and he just had the oh. set animal and then he becomes ha, Hasehem we. So uh, the, the appearance of the two um, managers, uh, authorities or whatever. Uh, and then he puts both animals. So there's clearly something going on very early in Egyptian history where um, there is a sort of a political uh, disagreement that is allegorically represented by these two deities. That's probably the situation that this story borrows from as well. So this question of who should rule, uh, Horus or Set, um, has like a, a sociological role. And that the answer that always seems to arise is that Horus should succeed Osiris on the throne because he's his son and the, the rightful heir. And that seems to serve the role of reinforcing primogeniture, which was the, the standard uh, means of succession in ancient Egypt. So, okay, so that's the basic background. Probably all we really need to understand this story. Uh, you'll need to know a little bit about the different gods and their relationships, but we'll also get some of it in here. Any idea what Set is? Uh, yeah, uh, very famous question. 
what does the set animal represent? Um, I think it's an aardvark, ant bear. Um, um, I think this is it. Yeah, so I'll put this in the chat. I thought this video actually made one of the better arguments I've seen for the identity of the set animal. Huh. Um, so it's it's very early. You can tell just by looking at uh, its its representation here in the early dynastic period. It's a super old symbol, and it's probably the case that it stylistically depicts some animal, and then the the appearance of the set animal itself becomes sort of fossilized in Egyptian art. So uh, later depictions, like the famous one, I think there's one of like. Ramses the uh, third with Horus and Set on either side. Let's see, is that who it is? Yeah, this one. Um, not a great photo. But so this creature, this fully developed set animal, um, is derived from earlier depictions. But the, there's a good argument to be made that the very earliest depictions were actually just stylized representations of aardvarks, which did once live. Uh, near the Nile Valley, uh, they don't anymore because of uh, the increasing desertification of the Sahara in um, in like the pre-dynastic period. So that, that was happening almost in recorded history. This, the Sahara around the Nile became drier and a lot of savanna type animals uh, stopped living there. Another argument and uh, my personal favorite is uh, African wild dog. I don't think it's correct. I just like it because these they're so cute. Uh, let's look at African wild dog puppy. African wild dog. Oh my gosh, what? It's so adorable. Um, there's there's a fair argument to be made that this could be associated with set. So this animal does did actually live in Egypt. I think it still does, uh, but it's it's highly endangered. So not very many of them. Uh, but they have the sort of uh, kind of strange ears. They have the mottled red and black coat, which is uh, fits with the iconography of Set. They have the little puffy tail. Uh, so if you look at depictions of the Set animal, he often has like a tail that sort of sticks up and then like has a fork at the end or a little poof at the end. Um, and that kind of matches. Yeah, the one possibility. Aardvark is another. If you're you curious about it, the Coptic hyena of, of widespread fame, is that an actual Egyptian hyena that? The um, Hoita, that one that we yeah. were talking about? Yeah, uh -huh. uh, there, there are hyenas that, uh, that live in Egypt. Because it's sort of, they look similar to that. The ears are different though, right? So could the set animal be a hyena? Yeah, right. Possibly, it it looks less like a hyena than it looks like other things. Um, mm. I think most notably, it doesn't have that sort of creepy, um, like its hind legs are are lower or shorter than its forelegs. It doesn't ever have that quality. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this thing, gosh, that's pretty close too. Uh, you can imagine an early stylized representation of this um, looking like the set animal too. So yeah, lots of choices. Don't, nobody knows for sure. Um, I really liked the argument that was made in this video though. I thought it was quite good. Uh, it actually convinced me that aardvark is the most likely answer to that question, uh, but we'll probably never know for sure. It's also, you know, you could, you could go kind of out on a limb and say like it could be a, um, an extinct uh, canid type species that actually looked remarkably like the depictions of the set animal uh, that has since gone extinct and um, you know for whatever reason it's it's fossils have never been identified and, and uniquely classified or whatever like you can you can hypothesize any number of answers we'll probably never have a definite answer uh, but it's it's one of those kind of things and it's a really good question because it's it's an intriguing mystery we would love to know for sure but we probably never will um Okay, good question. So what I intended for us to do getting started with this text, uh, as you see here, 
Uh, we have, why does that keep popping up? Let's go put this in a new window. Um, we have the beginning of the papyrus here. It's highly fragmentary. You can see that all the dotted lines in the transcription uh, show that the, the actual text itself is missing and it's been reconstructed. So I thought that this would be a really bad place for us to all start practicing our hieratic penmanship. And I thought what we could do instead is just start with reading the text uh, just from the transcription up until we get to uh, the, the next pages are, are much less fragmentary. And then we can actually start like engaging more directly with the hieratic text. So uh, what I thought we would do to get started is uh, read the hieroglyphic text one line at a time, you know, give a translation and then uh, put it side by side with the hieratic and then just uh, look for any problem spots. So we'll, we'll start that. And I guess I'll just call on people. If you don't want to translate from the text, just say so. Christian, uh, Maciej had a question in the chat. How do oh, we sorry, know the parts? How do we know the parts in uh, well that, that are fragmentary? Uh, we don't. So this has been reconstructed by uh, by Gardner, I think, in this case. And it's it's just an educated guess. So you can we can see a little bit. We can see fragments of things. Um, you can generally see roughly how much of how much text is missing. So you know that that constrains how many hieroglyphs you can put in that place. And then and then it's really just a guess. I mean, a lot of stories start in this way. Uh, there there are little fragments of these things. So you can kind of fill them in. Yeah, it's basically just an educated guess. But for for the sake of our purposes, we'll just we'll just treat those things as though they were really there. Because right now, all we're working on is um, you know translating and understanding the text, and then digging into the hieratic. I guess I'll just look at the list of people, and I will call on you, largely at random, based on the order that you're in uh, the thing. Uh, Aaron, hi. Do you want to translate the first sentence? Wow, first up. Yeah. Gestures high. Um, okay, so are we, do we, are, are we going to read through transliteration, or you just want me to translate directly? Um, you know, actually, that's our... a good question. Should I? I've gone back and forth on this. Um, do you think we should read the transliteration? It doesn't hurt anything. Um. I mean, it would be helpful for me because okay. I, there are some things that I just, I mean, even even down to parsing words at some points, I found a little difficult just because I'm entirely a beginner where grammar is concerned. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a lot of grammatical structure sort of trips me up in terms of vocabulary words. Okay. So I don't know. I, th I think it would be helpful. What, what, is it, what do other people think? Makes perfect yeah. sense. I agree. Same, same idea. It also helps to show how, how we pass it. Um, yeah. And how to identify a word or not. I mean, unfortunately, it will have to be the Egyptological pronunciation, right? But mm -hmm. we'll live. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's better than nothing. That's why we have it. But, uh, we're not going to reconstruct the vocalization because we're, right. we're just not there yet. And also uh, that you get into the realm of uh, like a lot of speculation. I'd like to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, all right. So I think the sentence goes up to um, I think it goes to, to here. Is? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Does the um, does the does the Chester BD uh, again? I apologize on my pronunciation as well. Does this document have transcription somewhere, or are we just yes. doing that as we go as well? Does it? It has, uh, if you speak Italian, somebody posted it on Discord. There is a, there's a guy I knew nothing about. His name is Enzo Kyurko. So Enzo, E-N-Z-O. Okay. We can look it up right now because that's really helpful. Enzo Kyurko. I couldn't Kyurko. find anything in the, uh, in the in PDF. Kyurko? No, it's not uh, Kyurko with a U. No, no, uh, C-H-I-U-R-C-O. R, R as in Robert, yep, as C-O. 
Yeah, you got it. Enzo Kyoko. It's already in the suggestions. That's the guy. Okay. And he has all these. There he is. Enzo Kyoko, Racconti dell'Antico Egitto. Um, just look for volume number 31, because yes, he has tons of them. Um, Publicazioni, yeah. yeah, that's it. And then just go down. I mean, lots of. Oh my of gosh, this is amazing. It's that's absolutely, I was, it's like mind blowing. This guy has transcribed them all. So just click on the transliteration wow. del, uh, del testo, uh, et cetera. <laughs> yep, there you go. Oh, fantastic. Oh, awesome. Oh, wow. this, is going, this is going in our sources straight away. Yeah. Oh, wait, is it all? This is amazing. It loads everything oh. with JavaScript? Oof. I guess you have to navigate to it every time. Wow. Yeah, unfortunately. I mean, I guess you could print that thing wow. to PDF if you wanted to, but it's cool. <laughs> That's a great resource. Wow. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it wasn't me, though. Somebody brought it up. I think it may have been Joey Jojo, or what his screen name is. I forgot. I think it may have been him. Uh, somebody had it in Discord. That was fantastic. I missed that. Um, I missed that discussion in Discord somehow, but this is, I'm glad you mentioned it because this is really perfect. Um... And by the way, there's a discrepancy in the first line between uh, yeah. our official version and this one. One has Sedum yeah. and one has, oh, how do you read yeah. it? Uput, uput. Web, webput. Webput. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, let's look at, that's that's actually a good situation for looking, because I thought there was a web in here too. Yeah, that's that's very distinctly part of web there. I think it's web. So I, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think the Sedum is wrong. Yeah, I think so uh, too. That fragment is not in Gardner's facsimile, so I think that fragment was found later. After ah, I see. So okay, so we got more of the story. Right. He interpolated. That makes sense. Because the chipper isn't there either, so you just have to know. Well, okay, I'll, sh I'll shut up. But <laughs> just yeah. one but, thing but, to I mean, point can, out where the two versions are. We can read it as it is, or we can change it to webhoot. Either one is really fine. For, for our purposes, we're huh. just getting through the text. Wow, amazing. All right, so. There it is. Oops. Okay, cool. Okay, so Kat, should I do it word by word? Should I read the whole line and then and then translate or should I just do word by word? Read the whole line? Yeah, let's just do the whole line. All right. Keper pa sajem haru kana, is set just pronounced set? I don't know if there's another pronunciation of that. Uh, Seta. Okay. Yeah. What, like which the, H is that? Yeah. It's an H. I know. It's, it's a used H. An unimpressed H. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Shatao. Mm -hmm. Kepri. Um, Aait. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Aait. Um, and then I don't know how to say this one. I don't know how to pronounce the princes. Is it just Weru? Oh, Weru, okay. Or Seru, maybe. Or Seru, yeah. yeah. Or Seru, yeah. Seru, okay. Seru, okay. And then, um, is it Iku, the next one? I thought this was uh, Semsu, but I, I mean, I don't know. I'm just oh. basing it off my own, my own guesses. Actually, mm. this, yeah, this, is a good, maybe. this is a good opportunity to look at this one. See what oh, yeah, is. okay. Um, well, he says where, where, which is also not correct because it's not, it's not the same word twice. Um, yeah. Right. But I've had really, a mythy Seru where, where, like the great prince. They, they repeat those two characters or two uh, walking stick characters a couple of times. Yeah. Normally the one that's kind yeah. of bent over is the Semsu sign uh, that means like elder. Okay. Is that pronounced were? Is that a word? Uh, that's pronounced some I think that could be where too, though. Yeah, I think that could be where. There's a lot of flexibility with these because obviously they look quite similar and even Egyptian yeah. texts uh, conflate them. Okay. Um, okay. And then uh, E. Capri at the end. 
that's it. And that's uh, end of my line. So translation, um, it came to be, it came into existence. Um, the And then sajem is meant to be like hearing in this case, or we've decided that's sort of the wrong thing probably, huh? Yeah, it'd probably be weput, which is like mission or assignment. Um, but yeah, here we have sajem, so hearing. Yeah. Okay. Um, Horus, uh, together with Seth. Mm -hmm. um, and then I translated this as secret, but the translation has it as mysterious. That's fine. Yeah, either one. Um, uh, mysterious form of forms. Um, great. Greatest. I have to ask a question. My ignorance is showing here. Um, under So in the word greatest, uh, at the very end, before the you know plural lines, the little schwa under the tea bread loaf. I don't. What is that? Um, yeah, I don't really know what that is. It's a Z five sign. It's like a hieratic little tick sign uh, that stands in for a lot of things. Let's. Why does it keep going to the wrong thing? Uh, let's just look at it. See what it has in here. It's like a long downward stroke. Yeah. And then what would that, oh, I'm in the wrong place completely. Oh, no, I'm not. No, no, you're not, it's there. Um, hang on, now I'm confused. Oh, this was after the grade, right? Yeah, after the grade. So, there it is. Here, yeah. So there's just a like little, it. It's a, it should actually be this, I think, in transcription. Yeah, oh, sorry, I, I think, think it's actually here. You're right. It does does look like a W an awful lot. That's how he normally writes it, especially at the end. Um, hmm. Hmm. Which makes sense. Here. Is it a T? Um, it, so that's, I don't know, because it doesn't really make sense for it to be a T. Um, mm. But like in late Egyptian, uh, superfluous T's show up all the time. So it's not it's not weird to have a T where you don't need one, uh, but you don't need one in this case because it's it's uh. a masculine plural. Hmm. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> where was I? Uh, oh, greatest. Okay, and then um, princes and uh, what did I put? Princes and lords. Um, whatever, great people and other great people um, had come into being. Yeah. Yeah, that's Happened. the end of my life. Happened. Oh, it's that, it doesn't come into existence. Uh, it is. So, so Hepper is, it's like become basically, but it's, there's no exact English translation of that word. Um, uh -huh. It can, Sometimes it can mean something that's just like be or exist, and sometimes it can mean like to come about or to come into existence. Okay. Um, so the, the greatest of the uh, great princes who existed, and so this this uh, this e part here before uh, the verb, that's the late Egyptian uh, relative marker. So it's the greatest oh. of the of the great princes who existed. Okay. Certainly makes more sense. All right. We'll definitely dig more into the, the relatives and how they work, but I feel like they're pretty straightforward. If you see this uh, E written before a verb, it's going to be, it's probably going to be a relative, honestly. It's, yeah, it's pretty reliable. So you just say who, who happened. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great job, Aaron. Uh, thanks, thanks for for stepping up to the plate. It's always it's always a little stressful to be the first one, but you did great. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Oh, and we're going to look at the hieratic. So this is uh, I figured after each sentence, we'll just compare the hieratic. Okay. I shouldn't have zoomed in so much. Uh, let me get rid of the name. I think there are also a few grammar things we could look at after the hieratic. Sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so anything weird about the hieratic, see, 
set animal, uh, falcon on a stick, the bird on a stick determinative, which eventually became something very simple like this and then becomes basically just that. Uh, so that's, that's in here, that's the G7 sign, kind of hard to see. I know there was a question the other day. Okay, so let's see where we are. Chitalu, uh, and then maybe it is a uh, maybe it is a just a tail of the said animal. No. Nope. It well, <laughs> so the it could the be tail is that it would probably look like that. And it's it's not in this case. Mm -hmm. It's definitely it's definitely a separate sign, uh, because consistently in this text, whenever they use the name of a god, they put that um, classifier after it. They are a bit smushed together here. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Yeah. Nothing really weird here. The scarab has become drastically simplified. It's just. Oh. One thing to point out, Christian, the, the W um, after, well, first of all, if we look at the sh at the Sheta Mysterious, um, the, the Aleph is really small. He always mm. does that. So it's, it's really tiny. Um, yeah. It was so tiny. Wait. So uh, yeah. Shirt, the, the T is, T is enormous. And then the T is comes huge. The, the, the T is huge. Yeah. Uh, you would read it as an R if you didn't know better. And then this this puppy exactly that's really tiny. If you look like middle kingdom hieratic, normally that's like full full height of the line. But right. he likes, just likes to make it really small, uh, especially in the article. It looks more like a like a little squiggle. The next one, the W, he always likes to draw over. I mean, drag over to the next sign. Um, yeah. That makes it really easy to identify too. It's one of the things cool. I I'm trying to figure out things as I go along, and so that's quite reliable. The, um, the book roll is a complete bugbear because it has lots of different forms. Here's one. Yeah. Here's one. It looks like a yeah. Z, but he has at least three other forms I found, how you can write it. And he uses them always the same in, in different contexts. So um, depending on the word, you will normally find the same. Yep, there's the next one with the plural strokes under it. Yeah. That's also the book roll with plural strokes. That took some getting used to. Yeah, that's very weird. Uh -huh. Let's see what else. Oh, here's another Aleph bird. Oh, this one's it's, big. You're right. It's big, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's it's also like normally I expect them to have that kind of like it looks like it's been leaned back. It's kind of here, mm -hmm. like you just it's been squashed and leaned back. Uh, what else? This T, as we said before, is barely barely existent. Um, we again have the uh, an even weirder. I think this is the stroke order here. Yep. Um, what is that right there? That's the little uh, the doodad on top of the scroll. Oh, on top of the scroll. Okay. He doesn't always write it though. So, yeah. The the last one we saw was almost identical, but didn't have that. Okay. Yeah. Christian, could you move the um, the hieroglyphic text over so it lines up with the hieratic we're looking oh, at sure. right now? I can compare. Okay, thank you. One of the we need an that app that does that automatically. I know. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be awesome Auto if scroll. we had like a line and another line so that we could say we made this judgment call with this set of hieratic with the hieroglyphic <laughs> transcription underneath it and then the transcription and kind of like what Enzo? Sorry, I'm thinking Assassin's Creed. Like an interlinear. Mm. Yeah, interlinear. Yeah, interlinear. Yeah, yeah, I know yeah. that's, I was asking Aurelio about that the other day. He, he sent me towards a resource for um, Shipwreck Sailor, but yeah, that, I feel like all of these should have interlinear texts. Yeah. So, Wouldn't that be neat? I agree. Would I mean, you almost be... want to make it, right? Like Word document, just yeah. take the graph, yeah, paste it in. Yeah, it's not that hard to cut and paste. Yeah. It just takes a long time. Yeah. yeah. I mean, huh. pretty much everything that you think should exist in Egyptology that, and you're like, why doesn't it? The answer is uh, time and money, basically. Mm -hmm. There's not that many of us. There's really yeah. not, there's not that many Egyptologists. It's fewer yeah. than you think. It's maybe a thousand people. 
Um, wow. So, yeah. Let's see if there's anything else interesting here. Oh, in this case, it's the seated man. It looks just like the other book rolls with uh, plural strokes, but it's, in this case, it's the seated man because it it makes sense. So this is the you know plural some some sort of official dignitary prince whatever, uh, and then the ooh, and then we expect like a, a seated man because it's a title, and then plural strokes because there's more of them. And the ooh kind of gives I us that. This yod looked interesting to me right mm. here because it had a hook on the top that I wasn't used to, but so I'm we to, can't, I'm not used to a lot of things. So. <laughs> we can't be sure. So it's very, so one of the things that happens with um, papyri, uh, you can actually see it here happening. Uh, fibers will flake off and they'll take ink with them. Uh, and then they'll expose the fibers underneath, which are identical in color to the background. Uh, this, this, the width of this stroke actually seems rather narrow to me based on the, the pen size. So we have a pen that has a shape sort of here-ish, right? If we kind of uh -huh. repeat this shape throughout. Um, and it's, it's kind of difficult. It's really what I would expect is to have this sort of shape. Right. Like if you show all the, the different pen locations kind of as like a time, time lapse mm -hmm. type thing. So I think that's probably where some of the ink or the papyrus it's fibers themselves have flaked off and left that hole. I'm gonna blab in again. He does like, and I think a lot of Middle Egyptian scribes do that too. He does like a, have to a little to have a little stroke on top of the of the eye. There's like a serif almost at the top. Yeah. So he does that. And it's also like you, you do look, this. You do like a little yes. jog. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. In some places in the manuscript, you can see it better. Where it's really like a a separate, like a little serify thing that he does. Oh, where can you see it? Maybe if you go down halfway. I noticed I saw it somewhere. I'm going to switch to our our much better viewer for this because it it's just better. The Adobe can't seem to handle zooming around, even though that's like so yeah. For example, that, that's, that was a good one. If you go a bit oh, over sorry. to yeah, this one right there. Yeah, see that? Okay. Um, so you have the end, and then comes another another reed leaf. Uh, mm -hmm. Second line from the top, and you can see mm -hmm. the first goes mm -hmm. like chick to the a little bit back. Most mm -hmm. signs start from the left and go to the right, so it's not like Arabic that goes continuously from right to left. But, but if you look at the stroke order, actually, I'm firm, firmly convinced that most strokes go left to right. And you can see that here, it goes like a little bit like to the right, then he goes down, and then comes to. You think it went like this? Point. Yes. Like in this way? Yes, absolutely. Oh, interesting. I think so. I didn't know that. I think hmm. so. If this is these actually look like distinct strokes. This the ink is darker yes. here. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So it is. Uh, I think it went from left to right, and it was like a distinct stroke. And you can see that, and for example, in the sailor too, he does that too. So this is what a thousand years later, yeah. but uh, still the same same way of approaching it. Yeah, about a thousand years later. Wow, that's a bigger time gap than. <laughs> than, yeah, I was, yeah. than I was imagining. Uh, when, yeah. Once you like actually put a number to it, it's like, wow, that is a really long time. Yeah. Isn't that true? I mean, Sailor 12th Dynasty, what would that be year-wise? Yeah, like 2200 BC. This is um, what, like 11, 1100 BC. That's, so that's 1100 years roughly. Uh, yeah, about a thousand uh, years. That's, that's, oh, it has uh, the number here. How convenient. It's kind of humbling oh, when you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, I talk a lot about how the written script changed over time, but you could also, you don't want to belabor the point because it's, it's worth remembering that it actually changed surprisingly little considering the amount of time involved. Like, yeah, this is late Egyptian hieratic. If you look at the shipwreck sailors, middle Egyptian hieratic, they look different. Uh, but they're the same script. They're they're identifiably the same things being written. Uh, stroke sequence will be different. Some things will be modified a little bit, but it's um, you know they're not different scripts. It's kind of like the difference. Um, the the difference I always notice in Germany is like German one 
a lot of times looks almost like a lambda because they do this the front tail so much whereas americans will do like a little tail or a little uh, initial stroke or none at all um but these are all you know despite their differences those are all very clearly the same thing and they're formed in the same way for the most part and you have the same thing here a thousand years later not that much change it's really slow and steady which makes it awesome for study like studying how writing systems change we have this almost continuous record in thousands of years of how it developed super interesting stuff quick question what is yeah. what is that i mean it Let's looks talk. like um i don't know what it looks like does it look like a little um a little furnace with burning coal poking <laughs> out of the top sure or like a coffee pot or something like that i don't know so it looks like a it looks like a percolator samawad samawad <laughs> russian connection confirmed oh god <laughs> uh question in here oh george is here i didn't see you here earlier george um oh interesting yeah, I don't know. do we know or can anyone tell if the scribe was right or left handed? Um, that's a great question. I don't know what sort of signs we would find for someone who's uh, left handed. I, I would look for smudging. Are any of these because their hand would, you know, because mm -hmm. they're going from right to left. But if you're right handed and going right to left, you might smudge it. But if you're left, Kind of like the same problem left-handed writers have writing English or right. Western scripts. Well, um, I, I think there's Probably, a, yeah, yeah. Uh, that could be. Uh, some, I, some signs are uh, more, more darker than the others because of uh, uh, he couldn't get uh, a por proportion of the ink. Maybe it is uh, about the something like uh, I I'm also left-handed, mm. uh, and if if you write with uh, something like I don't know, let, let me check. Uh, yeah, a, a, a phantom pen, something mm. like. Uh, uh, the liquid ink. If you write a uh, fountain pen, yeah, it, it is completely uh, make crap your uh, paper. Yeah. Because it is going off with your hands. Yeah, and your hand is hitting it and, and, and causing it to, to smudge. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't that might, so That might be. This is the wrong there. text to look for that, though. <coughs> Because this is a very fine text. This was produced by a professional scribe who purposely sat down and tried to make a really nice looking text. So you can imagine, you know, if you're writing wedding invitations, for example, um, you're not going to smudge the ink. Or if you do, you're going to throw that one out and, and pick up a new one and, and try again. Um, so I wouldn't expect to see smudging on this. I would expect to see it on things like ostraca. And in that case, I don't, I don't know that this has ever been studied. I've never heard of it, but you could do a, a sort of um, like a survey where you pick up a bunch of different ostraca and just kind of count examples of smudging or, or how many ostraca have examples of that um, like right-handed versus left-handed smudging and calculate the, the average probability or the, the, the likelihood of someone being left-handed I would guess that it's probably roughly five to 10%. I think that's fairly universal in human populations of left-handedness is a small percentage of people. Practice pieces, Although yeah. I wonder, I wonder in scribal training though, if they did like happens in a lot of cultures here where handedness is sort of beaten into children. So if a child presents with a handedness that they don't like, they sort of make them write with the non-dominant hand. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Yeah, I, I'm wondering. Egypt was so it it kind of goes both ways with that. So yeah. I don't I don't know that I've ever seen anything that associated leftness with negative things. 
So generally the left is like the east, it's the place of the rising sun. It's not necessarily negative that I've seen, not in the same way that it is like, like sinister in Latin is like, um, you know, where we get the word sinister is the word for mm -hmm. left. You don't see that, that strength of association between things on the left being kind of negative. On the other hand, Egypt, ancient Egypt was extraordinarily conservative as a society. And it would not surprise me at all to, to find out that like in scribal schools, you had to do it a certain way. And that was the only way. And if you did it any other way, that was wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. Because that's kind of a, you know, I don't want to overgeneralize, but that's a feature that you can see in, in Egyptian society as a whole. Uh, Especially with, with, with writing way. being, with writing having such a sort of sacred prominence yeah. and importance. And it has to be done exactly so. Right. And it's tied into like the state power structure, which obviously is conservative because, you know, the status quo is what it depends on for its existence. Um, so yeah, you, you, you start tying in religion and, and uh, politics and yeah, you get that kind of like, there's one way to do things. And if you deviate from that, you're doing something bad. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a great question. Uh, definitely food for thought. Um, I think it's a highly testable question, which is great because we, you know, things like the set animal, there's really nothing that we could go test to find out. But with this, we actually theoretically could. Um, okay, so I'm going to leave that there. We did one sentence, but that's okay. We'll get, <laughs> we'll get faster. Uh, we talked about a lot of cool stuff. And I'm going to put this video online later, uh, maybe tomorrow or, you know, when it happens. Um, and I'm uh, the, the hieratic class, um, not the hieratic, the hieroglyphic class is starting now. So jump over to that one if you'd like to attend. Okay. See you all soon. See you there. See you.